Colossians chapter number 2. Begin reading verse number 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Colossians, starts in verse number 1 of chapter number 2. He says, I've got a broken heart because I wish that y'all could meet me and that I could meet you. He had never been to the church at Colossia. Those that hadn't seen his face, those that initially started the church, they may have known him. Okay, to those that lay out to see you. He says, churches that have been planted out of other churches that he started, they who heard about the Apostle Paul, he says, I, I want to meet y'all. He says, I want to see the fruit of others, you know, faith and love and their willingness to go out. He says, I want to be there to comfort you, to give you some encouragement. That's what he says in verse number 2. He says, I don't want you to see my face so that, you know, I can get all the glory from it. Right? He says, I don't want any acknowledgement. I want to come and I want to be a help. I want you to see me so that I can help you. First, he says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. He's saying, I understand that persecutions come to these churches. I mean, keep in mind, you thought that the Jews hated Christ. Imagine how much more the heathens hate those that move into town and start living different and loving on people and people getting saved and then now the bar's shutting down and now the brothel shutting down and everything they didn't like them any much more than the Jews did just because they were Gentiles didn't mean that they had it easy those that live godly shall suffer persecution he says I want to be a comfort to you I want to be able to speak the words of God that your hearts can be knit together in love so strongly that the world cannot tear them apart he says I want you all to be codified as a unit fitly framed together, as he also said, to where your hearts are knit together by God so that no matter what happens, there's one heartbeat at the local church. That's what he's saying. Then he goes on to say, and unto all riches and full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Well, if you want to know what that mystery of God is, you've got to go back a few verses into chapter number 1, right? Right? Chapter number 1, verse 26, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, I desire that you have full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. He says, I want you to fully understand your salvation and possess it. He says, I don't want you lacking anything. Keep in mind, they didn't have the completed Word of God. Before he wrote this letter, they didn't have the book of Colossians. Until they received it, once it was delivered after he wrote it. So his desire was that I wish I was there to make sure that you were equipped with everything. By faith, he knew that God would equip him. That's why he was writing this letter. But he wants them to know that his desire was, I wish I could have been there instead of sending you the letter to tell you. He says, I wish we could have been able to do this face to face. He says, but I know that God will take care of it. Then it says, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Keep in mind, these are Gentiles. Before they got saved as heathens. If they wanted to know mysteries, right, or things that were beyond them, who did they go and consult? They went and saw sorcerers or magicians or soothsayers or whoever in town claimed to be the oldest and wisest. They had fables that explained why things were the way that they were. I mean, as much as, you know, I like reading comic books, you know where most of the themes in comics book come from? Pagan religions. Right? I, hey, last Thor movie was very funny. I enjoyed it. But you know what Thor is? A pagan god. 
They had things that explained why the sun went up in the morning and why it went down at night. They had things that explained why the earth was made the way that it was made. And almost every time it went against, in the beginning was God. He's the reason that it all was. So they had a tradition of seeking after many things, looking and trying to understand why things are the way that they are. And the Apostle Paul saying, I wish that I was there so that you could understand everything you need to know is in Jesus Christ and in God. He says, in, in God is hidden all the mysteries and the treasures, all the wisdom that you'll ever need. I mean, does not the Bible say that the Jews looked for a sign, but the Gentiles sought after wisdom? He's appealing to their nature and saying, all the wisdom that you could ever want is found in Christ. Saying you don't need anything else. He saved you completely. He can keep you completely after you've been saved. All that you need is in Him. And then in verse number 4, he says, And this I say, lest any man beguile you with enticing words. He's saying, I know what the flesh is like. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul might have been one of the most educated men on the face of the earth at the time. He sat under the best of Israel's teachers. Right? He, was, he said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Right? He's a cut above the rest. His entire life was spent given to understanding what the law of God was and how it should be applied. Now, it was, he wasn't always taught the right thing. Right? But, he's saying, I know what it is to desire after wisdom. He says, I know what it is for somebody to come in and say, here's that little nugget that you've been searching for. I can give you all the answers that you want. He's saying it's easy to be led away when you're looking for an answer and somebody promises that they can give you that answer. He says, so I'll tell you that regardless of what any man says, all the wisdom, all the treasures that you need, the fullness of your salvation is found in Jesus Christ. But if we go back to verse number 2, he says that he desired their hearts to be comforted, knit together in love, they also desired that they had all riches of the full assurance of understanding. The riches of full assurance of understanding. Well, the riches come from the full assurance, if we were to break down that sentence. It's been a while since I've taken English, but I still do understand a little bit of it, even though most of the time we speak hillbilly around here. Right, he says the riches of fullness of understanding. So you don't have the riches unless you have full assurance. Okay, well then he says, well what are you fully assured of? Of understanding. He says if you know that you know what you need to know. In other words, if God tells you what you need and you know that that's all you need. He says if you know that you understand everything that you need to know. You may not understand everything, but you understand what God needs you to know right now. He says, if you know that and you're assured of it, maybe not a doubt in your mind, he said, there are riches to be had in that. He says, the riches of full assurance of understanding. That God didn't leave anything out. He didn't withhold anything from you. That the man of God's not leading you on on a string, right, with the old carrot on a stick in front of the horse right? God's not just trying to get you to you know trot on down the road a little bit trick you into going just a little bit further no 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 I mean Jesus was the lame slain before the foundation of the earth wasn't predestinated who'd go to heaven or who'd go to hell it was predestined that those that got saved would look like Jesus that they'd be conformed to his image it was written from the beginning once you got saved what your life should look like. God hasn't hidden it. He's made it known from the beginning. In the Old Testament, He gave us types of Christ so that when He came, we'd know that that was the more perfect version. He sat on the throne of David, but He's greater than David. One day He's coming back to rule in Jerusalem, but He rules and reigns over everything. Right? We have types of what a godly individual would be like in the but when Jesus showed up John said I'm not worthy to latch his shoes they said I'm just the forerunner the one coming after me is a whole lot greater than John the apostle 
He writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In other words, Jesus showed up, and people knew there's something special about Him. The woman at the well knew that He was a Jew just from looking at Him. Then, once He started talking, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. Well, she got close to the mark, but she knew. He knew something about God, something that she had never heard before. The riches are not in knowing something. There are a lot of people, the world's ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. They discover something, and it doesn't satisfy them. They've got to keep going. There's no riches in knowing what they have. They always want more. Not in understanding the richness, or the riches are in full assurance. Complete and total assurance. Full assurance that you know what God wanted you to know. Now, let's just stop right here. I know that half of it hadn't been told, but if he, if he wanted us to have that half, if we needed it, we'd have had it. He kept nothing back. The half that hadn't been told is what's waiting on us once we get there. Right? I've got enough problems worrying about what I'm going to do here with this, let alone what I'm going to be doing once I get there. Right? But the richness... The greatest thing that you can possess outside of salvation. Because that's what he said, that their hearts may be comforted, being knit together. And then we get down to riches and fullness of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. He's saying your riches that you can have in full assurance is because you got saved. You acknowledge the mystery that God put Christ in you. That he chose these earthen vessels to house the most precious thing that has ever been, the only begotten Son of God. Why did God decide to do that? It's the mystery. Well, God is love. Yeah, but I was, I was pretty low down and unlovable. He loved me with an everlasting love. I still can't understand why He did it. Well, it's because of His grace and mercy. Well, I didn't deserve either. But why did God choose to do it? I don't know. But outside of salvation, the greatest rich, rich, or the greatest riches that you can have on this earth is having full assurance that you know what God wants you to know. So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach on blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Songwriter had one thing right. But this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. She understood that she knew what. God wanted her to do. All day long, she knew that she could praise God. She could sing unto God. I mean, we just came in, holy, holy, holy. That one verse, the seraphims fly around the throne of God, saying, holy, holy, holy. All day. He doesn't need us to praise Him, but He desires us to. You want to know where you found that out at? In the Word. And you know those that do worship and praise God, you know why they do it? Because they've received full assurance that that's what God wanted them to do. They're convinced of it. See, you don't get assurance without conviction. Because that's what conviction means. That you're convinced of it. In order to have the riches of being fully assured, to have blessed assurance, God's got to convince you that what you read is true. That what you hear preached is true. In other words, it's got to get past your ears and it's got to get down to your heart. In the last days, there'd be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. Not the preaching, not the teaching, not the expounding upon. Right? It's certainly not in famine for print. I mean, you may have trouble finding a good one down at the Christian bookstore nowadays, but I know where to get them. They're not in short supply. Now, in fact, we've got a room over there. I've got, still got my jail bag in my trunk, Brother Josh waiting to go back but it's stocked with a whole bunch of KJV Bibles you want one I can get you one we don't even have to go to the store we just gotta go to my car I got a whole room over there stocked up with them the famine is for the hearing well if you don't hear you don't have full assurance You're, you don't possess the rich you know, reward of having blessed assurance. 
See, the Apostle Paul knew that he could preach to them all day long, but he wanted to be there face to face. He wanted to be there, sit down and tell them, it's important that they didn't have this like we do. We're blessed beyond what they were. He wanted to sit down and tell them about all the times that he's, you know, may have been locked in a Philippian jail, right? Or they may have tried to stone him. Or they may have, you know, sought to kill him along the way as, you know, he was in custody with, uh, before he got to Agrippa. That's why he went to Agrippa, because they was going to kill him when they was transferring him from one city to another. And he said, through it all, you know what? I had blessed assurance. He said, the world would have looked at me and said, I had nothing, but he said, I had great riches. I knew what God wanted me to know, and I knew that that was enough. If he wasn't convinced of what God told him, he wouldn't have had that richness in his life. He wouldn't have had that bounty. He wouldn't have had assurance. Right? You can believe all you want to in the stock market, but at the end of the day, there's no assurance with the stock market. If you go to study it to try and get some assurance, you're going to find it fluctuates all the time. You're going to find that there have been some times that it's almost hit rock bottom. But it's come back. But the truth is, tomorrow, it could go right back down. There's no assurance. The Apostle Paul says, This I say in verse number 4, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He says, We're not looking for the approval of man and the wisdom of man and the understanding of man. He says, Because unless you have blessed assurance from heaven, anybody can come by and say something that will pique your interest. The Apostle Paul is saying, I have one desire, and that's to know the fullness of the mysteries of God through the person of Christ Jesus in me. He's saying, that's all that I need to know. He's got all wisdom. There's all fullness. I mean, he's altogether lovely. Taste and see that he is good. Right? I mean, he only was in the beginning. Without him was nothing made. If he made everything, he's got all the answers for me. Right? To know the Lord better should be my desire so that I can find out more about Him and realize how much I'm not like Him and then beg God to do a work in my life to make me more like Him. But even if I haven't completed, I'm not going to be like Him until I get a body like His. Right? I understand that. But I have blessed assurance that one day I will have it. It's going to happen. Whether I go through the grave or whether I get caught up in the air, it's going to happen. That gives me peace and I have richness in my life. I have joy knowing that even though one day I will get there, right now I can still improve. I'm convinced that He's given me everything through His Word and through His Spirit to where I can live a victorious Christian life for Him. If I didn't think that I could do that, what would the point be in coming to church? If you didn't have blessed assurance that you could be pleasing unto the Father, why would you even try you have to be convinced, not by man, because if man can convince you, man can unconvince you. If your faith is in man, man can cause you to doubt. Maybe not the same man, it may be a different man. But if you study the history of the world, unless God's the one that said it, the history of man is, well, one man said something and started either you know, a movement, a country, a whatever it was, and then another man came along and caused people to either doubt or he stole them away. It's the history of man. Well, I've got this idea. That sounds pretty good. Until another idea comes along. And another, and another, and another. But see, if God's the one that convinced you of it, only God can unconvince you of it. If it's settled down in the gable into your soul because not Brother George said it, not because Brother Doug said it, not because Brother Josh said it, right? not because your Sunday school teacher when you were a kid said it, but because God convinced you of it. There's nothing in this world that can change that. I mean, didn't the woman that came to Jesus, she didn't say, help my faith. She said, help my unbelief. She believed that He was Christ, but she's saying, Lord, Quiet those doubts in my mind that are saying, now you don't need to go to Him. He can't help you. There's nothing special about Him. He doesn't have the time of day for you. Even if He is the Son of God. Even if He is 
Christ. Why would he look at you? Why would he take time out of his day for you? She's saying, Lord, help those things that are trying to tempt me to humble it because I know that you're him. Even on days that you doubt, if the Lord's convinced you of it, there's something down there like Jeremiah. It's shut up in your bones like fire that even when you try to quit, try to doubt, there's something that says, no, you know that that's the right thing to do. That is the rich, the riches of full assurance. The richness of knowing that it's settled not because of a man, but because of God. All right, now turn with me a few bit, well, depending on how big the print in your Bible is. Turn a few pages with me. Over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Our pastor preached out of this passage on Wednesday night. I thought he was going to read this verse. And I about had a panic attack because I was thinking, oh no. He's going to preach everything I was going to teach on Sunday school. But no. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Well, I mean, the next verse he starts talking about those holy scriptures that he's known as a child. He's talking about that, but he's talking about more. Timothy was the first pastor of one of the churches that the Apostle Paul started. Well, what's he preaching if he's not preaching? What did he have as a child before Christ came? He had the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament wasn't saving people, so what's he preaching? He's preaching the New Testament, but the New Testament hadn't finished being written yet. So when the Apostle Paul tells him in verse number 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. He's saying you can be assured of them, not because of what it says, but because of the last part of the verse, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He's saying, if you've learned anything, Paul's saying, I didn't teach it to you. But you can take it to the bank because I know the one that did teach it to you. You know who that was? It was the Holy Spirit. Because he goes on to say, and we don't have time to get into it. But if you learn anything out of the words of God, the word is spiritually discerned. Just because it hadn't been pinned down yet, when the Apostle Paul preached it, if Timothy received it, it wasn't because Timothy was smart enough to figure out the mysteries of God. It's because the Holy Ghost revealed it unto him. He knew that what he took with him when he was equipped to go and be the first bishop, as it's written. I mean, you can look over here in the end of your chapter number 4. If yours, like mine, says the second epistle unto Timotheus, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. He was the first pastor after Paul left. He was the one that God said, he's going to be the one to preach to this church. Paul, you go start another church. Well, what's he preaching to them week after week? Because he hadn't received this letter yet. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church of Ephesians. But what's he preaching to them week in and week out? What the Holy Ghost tells them to preach. How can he preach it in power and assurance knowing that it's the truth? Because the Holy Ghost told it to him. God convinced him and that was enough for him. Blessed assurance is blessed because it doesn't come from man. It comes from God. You get in this word. If you're convinced of it, it's not because Brother Doug sat down for hours and answered all of your questions. Right? It's not because you went and had the most learned man in the scriptures sit down and explain it to you from old to everlasting. You can have all that happen and not be assured of it. But if you are assured, it's not because man did it, it's because the Spirit took the words of God, spoke it to your heart, and convinced you of it. And the reason that assurance is blessed is because if God tells you that, if you've got it, not from me, but from Him, and let me tell you, you'll know when you get it. Because if God convinces you of something that you really wanted to know, you'll either start weeping out of praise, you'll start shouting, you'll start running laps, you'll hit the altar thanking God for answering the thing that you needed to know. When it's settled, there's a result, there's a reaction. 
Blessed assurance let Timothy stand up in a wicked city preaching to people that were God's people and those that God wanted to reach. And he did it without fear or favor. He didn't do it with the enticing words of man. What did he do? God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them. He got up and reared back and he may not have hacked like our preacher. Right? He may not have been the most dignified speaker in the world. But you know what? how he preached? With the full assurance that what he was preaching was true. You can't get up and preach if you're doubting what you're saying. You've got to be convinced of it. Well, truly, you can't live as a Christian unless you're assured that God wants you to live that way. If you didn't believe that, well, we're supposed to be separated because we're called out from the world. We're no longer a part of the world. That we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Right? That we're pilgrims just passing through. I'm on my way to my home. This is not my home. If you didn't believe that, why wouldn't you set up shop in the world? Right? But if you have assurance that there's a way called straight, and it's an old path, and there are very few that say, return to the old paths, restore them. But if you get on that path, those that just follow after God, He's always taking care of them. Example after example. Given for what purpose? So that you could have full assurance that if you follow after God, God's going to take care of you. And if the Holy Ghost convinces you of that, doesn't matter what enters your life, you know I'm staying on this road. I'm setting my face like a flint towards heaven, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. That's where my focus should be. Not on what's happening to me, not what's going on around me, because I have been assured and fully assured that His way is the best way. Those that don't live as Christ would have them to live, they don't have full assurance that that's what's best for them. And let's be honest. Is not God no respecter of persons? So if the Apostle Paul wrote that he wanted the church at Colossia, or Colossia, however you want to say it, that that church, he wanted them to have full assurance. That means that he knew God could give them full assurance. So if God was willing to give them full assurance, that means that God's willing to give you full assurance. And if God wills it, and it doesn't happen, why is it? Because man's will did not conform to God's will. If you don't have full assurance, it's not because the preacher hasn't preached that message yet. It's because I have slacked in my duty to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If I don't have full assurance, I should be ashamed. Because it's not God's fault, it's my fault. If I don't have the richness and the blessing of knowing that I know what God wants me to know, that's not God's fault. I've got everything I need. And I've got a better teacher than the world could ever give me. Because he's the one that wrote it. Because he overshadowed holy men and used them as pens, like we heard about on Wednesday night, to pin the book in the first place. The Holy Ghost. I'd rather just ask the one that wrote it what I need to know. Now trust me, I've got a lot of commentaries. I've got a lot of reference books. Most of them are in my iPad so that I can save, save shelf space in my room. But you know where I found the most help and the most understanding? I've got every message that Spurgeon ever preached. Or that was ever recorded that he preached. But you know where I've gotten the most help? Right here. And I didn't come back to this after reading somebody else and a light bulb come on. I've gone and I've studied things like customs and Jesus' day. Word doesn't talk a lot, but let's be honest. I don't need to know the customs of, you know, 0 AD to 30 AD to understand that Jesus was Christ. I don't need to understand that to know that the Pharisees were religious. They were whited sepulchers. They were nice and pretty on the outside, but full of dead man's bones. They were cisterns that couldn't hold any water. I know what that means. I don't need to know that they's the religious. I know that they made promises 
but they didn't have fullness of assurance. They weren't fully assured of what they were doing. They knew that this is what God said, but this is what we're telling people. I don't need all the commentaries and all the historical references to get that. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost told me, these Pharisees, these hypocrites, generation of vipers. I know what that means. Not good people. See, this. Right here. I told people, I got this for my birthday one year. Right? I picked a nice color that was different from everybody else's because I like being different. Okay? But you know what I told people when I got it? This is my new best friend. About playing on it lasted me a while. Why? Because it is. This is the lamp into my feet and the light into my path. This goes with me so that I go with God. Because without it, leaning on my own understanding, no telling where I'm going to be. But, but if you don't have full strength, you're not going to live as unto God. You're not going to live as Christ intended you to live. We're not going to be conformed to His image. Uh, but lastly, we're running out of time because I've done a little bit of rambling. If you don't have full assurance, you're not going to go. See, most of, the most of the reason that people that don't have full assurance, that don't know what God wants them to do, they aren't aware of what the will of God is for their life, and they're not doing the will of God in their life. One of those two. You know the reason that they keep coming back week after week and sitting in the same place in the church? Because it's their comfort zone. It's become a routine. Their assurance comes from the fact that I've done this over, I know this is the right thing to do, I'll just keep doing it. Well, it's the right thing to do if you do business with God. But if you walk out unchanged, all you've done is wasted your time and God's time. If you walk in knowing that, well, I'll be back next Sunday morning, or I'll be back at Easter or on Christmas. If you walk in with a heart hardened to hearing, what's going to be done? All you're doing is tempting God to break your heart like you did Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would let the pe uh, God's people go. And trust me, I've had a broken heart a few times. I don't want to have a heart that's been broken by God. Right? But anyway, just a thought. Those people come out of repetition. Their assurance, their comfort comes from the fact that this is, this is my happy place. Right? As long as I'm here, I'm okay. But what if God wanted you to get out of your comfort zone? Those that don't, it's because they're not assured that God can take care of them outside of their comfort zone. If the response to, well, this is what God wants you to do, whether you're reading from the Word of God, whether you're hearing preaching. Right? But if God convicts you that this is what you ought to do, if the answer is no, well, one, there's a problem. But two, if the reason is because I like it here, here is what you're trusting in. Your faith is not in the one that put you there. Your faith is in where you are. Full assurance will say, I'll go wherever he wants me to go. I'll do whatever he wants me to do. Because he bought me with a price. But since he bought me, that means he's the one that's responsible for taking care of me. All I have to do is take care of what he tells me to take care of. He handles everything else. Because he bought means he owns me. And I mean, even the reed that they gave to Jesus while they were beating him in the hall of the praetorium, that's a dried out piece of grass. Right? It'd crumble if the wind blew too hard. But everything that's been committed unto him, he takes care of it. They took the reed from him. You know what that means? The entire time they were beating him, he held on to it just hard enough to hold it, but loose enough that he didn't crush it. If he could take care of that reed, he can take care of me. All while being beat with the sins of the world being poured out on him. Knowing that the Father's getting ready to break fellowship with him. 
he can take care of that reading, I'm in good hands. And oh, by the way, if that wasn't enough, his hand's in the Father's hand. So he's got to get through God twice to get to me. Whatever it is. Daily, he makes intercession for me at the Father's side because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. God's praying to God that God will take care of me. You know why I'm assured of that? Because the Bible tells me so. I've got a great high priest. He's the best. You know what that means? I can go about my business knowing that he's going to take care of everything that he needs to take care of. There's riches in knowing that wherever I go, if I'm in the will of God, it's got to come through him before it gets to me. I don't want to stay in my comfort zone if that's not where God wants me to be. Because then, outside of the will of God, I've broken the hedge. And he that breaks the hedge, the serpent bites. I don't want that. I've never been bitten by a snake. Don't want to be. Okay, in fact, if we're being honest, if a snake tried to bite me, there's a good chance that there might be seven hollow or seventeen hollow points, you know, either in the ground or in that snake by the time it got to me. All right? I don't want to be snake bit. Especially spiritually. What's the best way to avoid that? Being in the will of God. Because if you're in the will of God, God's got you hedged in, just like he had Job hedged in. The devil couldn't touch Job until God allowed it to happen. And you know why God allowed it to happen? Because God knew Job. And he knew that Job wouldn't break. I mean, it's in your Bible that he won't let you be tempted above what you're able. And in every temptation, he makes a way of escape. There's a richness Every, worth more than anything in this world there's a sweetness to it there's peace that comes along with it and it'll pass all understanding there's comfort in that you know why in verse number 2 when it says that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love you know why the apostle Paul knew that if they had full assurance they'd be comforted because you may be going through it but if I've got full assurance I know that God can comfort you so I'm just going to love you like God and do my best to comfort you I may not be able to give you the peace that passes all understanding but I can help bear your burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ I may not be able to speak a word fitly spoken but I can pray for you and unlike Job's friends if I take a week off of work and just sit there with you, God give me the grace not to say something stupid that's going to end up upsetting you. Right? But be there as a comfort. Not judging, but seeking to restore such a one. Maybe they don't need to be restored. Maybe they're just going through a storm. They've done nothing wrong. God just may be trying to peel back the curtain on their life and show people that what's in them is precious. Because they have full assurance. Not in what's outward, but what's inward. If you've got that, the world can't touch you. Worst thing you can do is send me to heaven. Let's go. Worst thing you can do would be to rob me of that full assurance. But if God assured me of it, you can't rob me of it. Hearts are knit together when you believe in and you're assured of the same thing. If God puts you here, right, because we are fitly framed together. If God puts you here, I've got full assurance He's going to graft you in to the vine of this, this church. You're not just going to be a piece of a puzzle, right? No, you become a part of. So our pastor says, once you're a part, you're always a part in some shape or form. You may go on, God may use you somewhere else, but you are always a part of here because God made you a part of this. Right? Just because God may take one vine and move it to a different branch, right? Because that's what he's talking about with grafting in the church. But if God moves or if God replants, doesn't mean that the roots and that the connections and the love that was grown here goes away. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I desire that you see me face to face. 
because I know that you exist and I have a love for you, but I wish that I could make my love for you known. Saying, I wish that our hearts could be knit together because I desire to know you. I desire to give you comfort. He says, and I desire to preach unto you that you may have full assurance that all your questions be answered. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of people they go to so-called churches or they go to the, some of them may be independent fundamental Baptist churches. But if they come and they have a question because they desire to know, because let's be honest, when you got saved, you didn't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. That's why God instructs us to train up, right, to teach, to show people. I mean, in the teens class not too long ago, I thought this is how you, you could study the word. You can study it by verse. You can study it by topic. You can study it by, you know, a, a person or thing. We went through it. I said, but studying and then reading are two different things. Right? Study to learn more. Read to find out what God wants you to have today. But why is that important? Because if they have a question, I want them to be able to know how to go get the answer. But there are people that God's called to preach. They don't have an eighth grade education. They know more about the Bible than anybody you know in here could possibly hope to know. You know why? Because they don't. They figured out that if they want the answer, they just got to ask God. If they say, "Lord, I desire to know that," and they get in here by faith, being fully assured, without doubting that God's going to give them the answer, God's going to give them the answer. Those that spend time with God learn about God. And in that process, He fully convinces you. There's no doubt. When storms come, there's no hesitation on facing it. Right? When it looks the darkest, you've got the thing that shines brightest. You want to know why people can face things in their life and seem to be unfazed by it? Because deep down... They don't have some assurance, they have full assurance. And their assurance is blessed. Not by man, but by God. Because they've just trusted what God gave them. I mean, no wonder the songwriter wrote, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. You know why it was blessed assurance? Because she believed that Jesus was hers. Not because the man told her. Because God said, no, no, no. I'm in you. He sealed us with the Holy Ghost. Then she's, she got such a good taste. She said, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. If this is just the beginning, the foretaste, heaven's going to be sweet. I'm going to start singing a song here if I don't quit. So this, this is what we're going to say. Wonderful song. You know why it's got juice on it? Because she had full assurance that all that was true. And God blessed her faithfulness to write it down. full assurance being fully convinced and being convinced that it's not what I wanted to teach you not what the preacher wanted to preach but it's what God wanted you to hear so that God could convince you of it outside of salvation greatest blessing that you can have in your life but without it anything can make you crumble you know why Jesus said he was the solid rock? Because there's nowhere for you to fall through or to fall off. If you're convinced of that, I don't have to worry about where I'm planning. But if I'm not convinced of that, everything is sand. Not because Jesus isn't the rock, but because I don't believe, even though he said he was the rock, that he was the rock cast, you know, cast aside by the builders, but God made it chief of the corner. I can hear it, but unless I believe it, it doesn't do me any good. I may know it, but unless I apply it, it's not going to help me when I face a storm. And the best way you can apply it is not to say, Lord, give me the answer. Lord, convince me. Help my unbelief. Help me wrangle this flesh and the desires of my heart Get rid of them and replace them with yours. Convince me so good that nothing can unconvince me of it. Because anything that is not of faith is of sin. And unless you are fully assured, 
there's some doubt. Last thing I want to do is doubt the one that gave everything to have me, even though I wasn't worth it. If he cared that much about me, I want to care enough to be fully assured of what he wants me to know so I can live a life pleasing unto him. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.